Polish? Have you ever uh, been to Poland? Ah, I have been not in this life. Not in this life. Except in YouTube. Right. To be somewhere, you don't need to be there physically anymore. Uh, do you have any relatives or any ancestors from Poland, maybe? Um, that you know of? Not that I know of, but I remember one of... I still remember his name from a school, my primary school, Jersey Sahaki. Does that Sorry? sound Polish? One more time. Jersey Sahaki. That's a, 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 a six or seven year old, how are they pronouncing his name? But he was like uh, from Poland. Alright. Long time ago. Oh, did you play soccer with him? Yeah. Alright. Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you like to come to Poland? Uh, my likes and dislikes are <laughs> not part of the equation. Okay. These days I have to do uh, what is possible. The Terravada Foundation that um, I yes. represent, yeah. maybe we can all, uh, send you an official invitation one day. So Yes, you can send an official invitation. But I just even, um, uh, a couple of days ago, it was a very strong invitation to go over to um, Vietnam. And I said, I can't do that because it's just too many invitations. What they said was that, um, uh, oh, please, all your books are very popular over there. And there's lots of people who would really benefit from your teachings. And I think that's what you would ask me as well. <laughs> And it's really quite a big project. I've been there. Of course, I've been there. Of course, I've been there. So, can you tell us how did Bodhinyana start? It started when we were. Um, desperate for a cup of coffee. We were looking at some piece of land uh, quite a distance from here and on the way back we passed a real estate agent and the real estate agent um, here in Byford uh, close by. The last time we went to ask if anything was there he gave us a cup of coffee. So it was <laughs> just trying to get a cup of coffee. And so we went there, had a cup of coffee and was one of his friends was there and said, oh, I remember this piece of land they could not sell a few years ago, no one wanted it, and that might be just the place for you. And of course it was. So this is very good anyone in business. Please understand that you know, if you give your, your clients just a cup of coffee, it's really good for business, <laughs> especially if it's two Buddhist monks or <laughs> coming by <laughs> looking for something. So anyway, it's called the law of karma. You kind to other people and you get good rewards back. So anyway, there we were looking for a land, so we got this place and no one else wanted it and we couldn't afford it, which usually happens. And so we made an offer which should have been refused because it was way under what was uh, asked for. But the person there, he was an old fellow, he could not find his sheep and cows when they grazed here because it was just too hilly. So there's too many places here you can just escape and hide. And that's perfect you know, for what we were looking for. So we got it. But that was the start of our problems because we had no money. In fact, we were in debt. So, and no places to stay. It was just uh, uh, empty land. Great for cows and kangaroos, but not for people. So the first day I came here, that I could not find where I'd put my uh, place to stay, so I slept under a tree, literally. No, no blankets, no... Um, uh, pillows, nothing, just on the ground. So just like the good old days, we started from the very, very basics. A little by little, we worked very hard. It was always one brick at a time. You never had great plans, you know, how it's going to be in the future. And in fact, we just, uh, when we had a bit of money, we did some work, and then we built little by little. And after many, many years, I think one of the first things when people found out that we were serious. We weren't just going to come in and then just disappear. We were in this for the long term. So that's one of the reasons why even the first buildings we built were built really solid. 
We could have put up tents and just caravans, but that would be giving the wrong impression. And that meant that people, after a while, they realised that, yeah, these monks are going to stay here. We started giving teachings as well and meditating. But it wasn't just teachings and meditating, it was just how we live those teachings in our life. We are actually practising them. And they impressed people. So little by little, uh, we managed to build up a community here. And then came Jana Grove. Jana Grove, yeah, because we did have um, some uh, people meditating, uh, but the problem was that here you had the monastic life as well, and it could not be a meditation center and a monastery at the same time, because you know, there's other little things we have to do, like giving interviews, <laughs> which would dis disturb a meditation center, and you know other little ceremonies which we have to do. And the beautiful the way that you know, you've seen that we have our lunch here, which is you know, inspiring. And quite often you ask them, why do you do this? And they say, because we get so much inspiration and joy out of this. And it answers the question, why is it that in other months we could actually be self-sufficient? You know, we could just grow some gardens and cook our own food. But it's missing out on something, the connection and the beautiful act of uh, generosity of giving and receiving which makes this Theravada system work. So, no, we don't put a, we've got a wall, but the well, gate's always open. We don't sort of seclude ourselves and have nothing to do with uh, the lay community. And we come in for a certain time during the day to connect, which I think is a very beautiful way of the Buddha said, you know, that we should depend upon the generosity of lay people. And it also means it's a sense of, uh, if we don't provide a good service, you know, if we're not good monks, then people won't feed us. So it's a little like a, a safety mechanism there. If you misbehave, then you, you'll get very thin. Because we're doing such a good, good job, that's why I'm very sad. It's just what you can expect. <laughs> <laughs> so Jana Grove? And Jana Grove, yes, so we wanted a meditation retreat centre. And so again, saw a nice place over there. And again, as we collected some money for it, again never enough, we bought the land. And then later on, uh, we uh, decided, yeah, let's build a retreat centre. And as usual, that you know, getting permissions and getting this and getting that, it was just uh, never enough funds. I said, oh, what the heck, let's just do it. And the funds came later on, as they normally do, at the last minute. Because I remember just looking after that and just getting this huge bill for about three or four hundred thousand dollars. How the heck am I going to pay for that? Impossible. But then, you know, a bit of asking around here and asking around there, borrowing from this and borrowing from that, you know, you managed to actually to get enough to pay the, the builder. That was very, very, very tight at the last moment. But it was just even the process is very beautiful. And lastly, just the, uh, to have the, the ambience of the place. A nice, uh, peaceful um, little island surrounded by forest. And if you look at the aerial picture of it, you can understand that you know, it's a little island of, of uh, an open area, and just forest on all sides. And it's got beautiful Feng Shui, nice views over the ocean. And it's... Uh, a very peaceful place. Some people love it there. Okay, and then was Damasara? Damasara, that was the next thing. That we had, uh, you know, where are the women? And you, know, you can't, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, and it's also the fact that these days, that actually even the old days, that you know, there was still equity and fairness. This is, it's not just a modern movement, even in the time of the Buddha, and may all beings be happy and well. You know, it's always all beings. It's not just men. It's not just Asians. It's not just uh, healthy, strong beings. It's all beings. And there's a wonderful little idea there that you know you should never uh, discriminate according to gender, sexual orientation, or even just health or age. A person can do it, obviously, give them a chance. So anyway, so because of that, I uh, decided that, you know, we should really, as much as possible, open the doors to, you know, all beings. And with that came 
the the idea of well, just knowing, just in tradition, it's always been the case. Whenever there is a woman's community uh, alongside a men's community, it was always the men who dominated. And so I didn't want that to happen. I just wanted the the women just to, to prove that you know they could do whatever the men could do. So give them their own community, and they've really lived up to to you know, my my hopes. And that give them their own you know, community. It's also at the same time it means that. Uh, this place is to the south of Perth, the south of the city. The uh, Dhammasara Nuns Monastery is to the uh, the east of the city. So you know we're we're spreading ourselves around. So you know we we can serve a greater part of the community in Perth. With Dhammasara, it was just building the place first of all, and then the again the next part was the ordination of the of the nuns which was resisted to the narrow by many parts of Buddhism. And I will not say by the traditionalists, because I always say I am a traditionalist, Theravada Buddhist. So you quote back from the earliest texts, you know, what the Buddha would do, and how the Buddha set up everything. So, you know, I'm more fundamentalist. <laughs> so, you know, go back to the earliest and justify everything. The other ones are just pandering to... Uh, uh, parts of uh, Buddhism, or rather culture, which came much later after the time of the Buddha. And so, uh, what they think is tradition is actually just the last two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred years. And so, that was wonderful to have the bhikkhuni ordination here. And that made a lot of people even more uh, inspired and respect Theravada Buddhism. That, you know, we, you know, we were uh, showing leadership in areas which needed uh, leadership, especially to have equity and respect for all, all genders. So can you say that this Buddhist monastery and uh, the BSW area is the avant-garde of the Theravada movement? No, no, is it's, it just, gonna... it's just so, so traditional. It's so just uh, harking back to the original teachings of the Buddha. And so, <laughs> by doing so, it's fascinating that it's regarded as avant-garde, or it's regarded as progressive, it's regarded as, as uh, uh, respecting modern times, it's respecting modern times and ancient times. Compassion has got no age limit. It's not fashionable in one area and unfashionable in another area. Meditation just, it works no matter sort of what uh, sexual orientation, what age, what anything. So the heart of uh, Buddhism is timeless, ageless, beyond fashion. You know, it's just basic kindness, compassion. And so you can say by going back to the early stage, we're actually moving forward. Exactly. Bhante, you had some problems with, uh, with the ordination. Can you just go... Ah, the ordination. It? it was just reactions to the ordination. And so... Um, you did get ex the word was at the time. So I can't really call it excommunicated, or that's what you know, they thought it was, because that's not done according to the, the rule of the Vinaya. And so some people call it expel expulsion, but these days I call it liberated. <laughs> you know, from sort of a a group you know, which was well-meaning, but really not well informed. They're living in a tiny world. And because of that, that, I think little by little they start to see that that's not really a tenable way to live their life and to, to make Buddhism popular, which is part of our job. The Buddha said, just go and know to by the same way for the, for the benefit and happiness of all living beings, all people. Right. So, okay, maybe we can talk a little bit about meditation? Yes. So, just now you've you've been giving so many stories, so I'll give a short story. Just yes. To... Okay. <laughs> okay. There was a Polish monk in two thousand and eleven. Yeah. He went to uh, your retreat. Yes. And he tried really hard to uh, to get the jhanas. You probably have heard so many stories yeah, about that. Indeed. And 
at the end of the retreat, he was like, oh, I'm a failure. Yeah. Classic, right? You look then, into Western psychology. Right. Then he went back to the Kuti in his monastery and just sat there and just like... Gave up. Gave up. And then he saw breath in the body. Yeah. And that was a very good meditation in my yeah. But the question is, because you're, you're going to your teaching the jhanas, which is like, uh, I call it classical jhanas, which mm -hmm. is like, uh, well, nimitta and, and no, sense, no senses and stuff yeah. like that. In Kayagata Satisutta, in Majjhima Nikaya, there is yeah. this uh, passage where there are jhanas and there is the, they, they, are, they are in the body, you might say. Yeah, so, they use the word body, but it's the same as Anapanasati. The breath. But when you go deep into the meditation, you're not watching the breath anymore. You know, you're watching the Piti Sukha, just the joy. You're watching the Jitta. And then you're liberating all these things. So you know, sometimes the people uh, need to really get their heads around Pali and also all of the, the idioms. And have often actually caught, uh, made sort of comparisons, you know, with this. I don't know about much about Polish, but with English and the crazy idioms they have in English. It rained cats and dogs. So that means in England you get a big shower and all these kittens and these puppies and these dogs come down <laughs> from the sky. Of course it doesn't mean that. Because a word means different things in different contexts. This is one of the things which comes up is like uh, I just because it was a crossword puzzle the other day, thrush. What is thrush? It's a it's a bird. But it's also a disease of the, of the throat. So you know, but in different contexts, it means totally different things. So that's why that sometimes the word kaya, and it's something which has totally different meanings in different contexts. Uh, I've I've talked to many people who were having a good meditation oh, yeah. and their base uh, was body yeah so uh, the the thing is and this is me talking from a compassionate yeah. point of view that they they might strive really hard to get the the classical jhanas the people just you know, we're, we're almost brainwashed into thinking that to get anywhere you have to strive now, it's the case that um, even the history of Buddhism should actually um, give you some examples of that, some indication. There was Siddhartha Gautama, six years, striving, getting nowhere, just getting frustrated. You know, almost about to give up. And part of the striving was just being really the tough guy. And so when he decided to eat properly and just, you know, become a bit more compassionate to his body, that then his friends thought he'd just given up, he stopped striving. And that's actually where that uh, he found his other path, that middle way. It wasn't about striving, it was about using the wisdom power, the kindness power. And that's just so important because it's a striving which actually stops you attaining those jhanas. That is the problem, striving. Because to strive, you're under control. The jhanas, you have to let go. Two totally different paths. And the problem is that people are just scared of letting go. We haven't learned that. We think, oh, just fall asleep. Oh, everything will fall apart. Oh, mine mind will wander all over the place. And so, you know, they let go. It does wander all over the place to start off with. You do get a bit lazy to start off with. But carry on. Wait for a little while. See what happens. I mean, that's all the teachers used to say that. Ajahn Chah. He would wave his hand up and down like this and say, this is a leaf on a tree, it only moves because of the wind. If the wind stopped, it wouldn't stop straight away. It would just take some time and then it would become perfectly still. And so that's the nature of the human mind. It's, if you want something, that's the wind. Craving, wanting. In fact, craving is far too hard a word, usually like wanting, desire. Wanting something, even something good, that causes the mind to move. So you don't get anything, except frustration. But if you can, have the courage to let go. And part of letting go is kindness, loving kindness, metta, compassion. 
just open the door of your heart to what's happening now. And just after a little while, the mind stops. It becomes very still. But when that becomes still, is from stillness you get disappearing. That's the cause of no desire, stillness, things disappear. And one of the things which disappear, of course, is your five senses with your body. So you close your eyes and sight disappears. Smell, taste, easy to let go of. And the physical feelings of the body and sound, those are the two hardest. Physical feelings of the body, but just by a lot of times using the breath is one of the best ways. It doesn't have to be the breath. You know, sometimes you can let go of the body, allow it to be so, so still. But also just uh, the breath is one of the best ways. Because you focus on the breath, that's all you've got. You can't feel anything else in your body until eventually once the breath uh, gets very soft, that disappears as well. And that's why even the Buddha said the, the, the thing which can get into the first jhana is sound. Sound, just because it, uh, it is a defense mechanism put into our mind that uh, if we always warn of the approaching tiger or the snake through the slither of the leaves in the, in the forest, it's always the sound which is our last form of defense. And it's sound which can take us out of a coma, which can actually wake us up from the sleep. That's why we have the bells and the ding, 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 the fire alarms. So, because of that, that uh, it's really clear to me that you have to, to be a jhana, the five senses have to vanish. It's not about will, because if you're willing, if you're doing something, you're trying, it doesn't work. Just to make it clear, if people who have, they claim that they have jhana and the body is the base, yeah. uh, you would say it's, it's upachara samadhi? Yeah, well, probably not even that. It's nice, nice pleasant feeling, nice and peaceful, calm, pleasant, but it's not the jhanas. Right. So, you know, the, I know that thing Kaja Bhamani said, oh, you're making it way, no, this is because um, uh, he follows my teachings of or Buddhist teachings, I would say, and to say that, uh, he said, oh, it's just making it too hard for others, you should be more compassionate. Now look, <laughs> you can't sort of uh, say like enlightenment, like anything is enlightenment, or anything is a stream winner. That's missing the point. You, know, you can't say like a, a, uh, an aircraft is a, is a, is a bird. It's an aircraft flying ahead over the moment. You know, you have to be truthful. And it's not making things difficult for people, it's actually making things possible. And it works after a while because the problem is now that everybody in this, you know, for years, many people just stopped even talking about jhanas. They thought it wasn't necessary. And monks like myself come along and say, it's really necessary. You know, you show that it's really necessary to have jhanas to get sort of stage of enlightenment. And now at least people have understood, yeah, it's part of the Eightfold Path, you can check it out for yourself. It's necessary. Now that we've man managed to win that sort of battle, this really important, now everybody's coming onto the bandwagon and say, yeah, you know, jhanas are necessary, so I've got jhanas. And I mentioned that I went to two very prominent teachers in the United States, and they wanted to talk to me. I thought, you were passing the junkies. They said, no, no. Because our teachers has now you know, confirmed that jhanas is necessary, and so we're talking about jhana light, L-I-T-E. The first time I heard that, and what it really is is just, yeah, accepting that jhanas are necessary, but lowering the bar to something it's really not. And you, know, you can't do that. That's just both intellectual dishonesty, but it's also it's um, it's not treating the people you're teaching with respect. Of course you can do it, but eventually you just you, know, you find that trying to get there, wanting it, that's the, the obstacle. So what do you do instead? You just sit here and let go and have the patience. 
wait until let it happen. But don't get frustrated because that's you know, more self, more me. I'm a failure. I'm great. I'm hopeless. I'm better. And that's the sort of stuff which you know forms the basis of uh, letting go. And see, simple things like kindness, compassion, beautiful basic teachings of the Buddha. Being kind to yourself. Being really kind. It's kindness is a part of letting go. And everything starts to, to happen. They go very peaceful. And people attain these things. When they stop trying.